Hey, thanks for joining me. Hope you're doing well. The toroidal field of flat earth dictates that at the center is where energy pours out from and converges. This is both the entrance and exit into other realms, where energy is condensed and released after being squeezed into a sort of singularity. Multiple mythologies throughout the ages have told us what's required to follow our compasses and come pass through. Our intent must be aligned with what we call love and unity if we are to be transported into this long-forgotten paradise, powered by the internal sun, or black sun. The black sun processes our thoughts, intents, and emotions, and shines down through the gateway of its sister, the white sun. When the white sun's rays hit the axis mundi, the black sun, in its parallel dimension, transforms this light essentially eating it and turning it into the aurora lights, imprinting the ether with the collective's memories, intense, the metaphorical green lion devouring the sun. This is why we are tied to the Black Sun's creation loop. We are aspects of Sophia the Black Sun being played out in this matrix. The sun is our higher selves shining down on us, and the astrolite is the aura of the sun. It's in the name, Aura of Ra who is the Egyptian personification of the white sun. The heart chakra is the same emerald color as the aurora lights. This is no coincidence. To successfully pass, one must have activated the emerald green ray of their hearts, as within, so without. Eight-pointed stars or eight-rayed symbols have typically represented a gateway. This includes the cross of the Elu, a depiction of Bab Elu, the Babylonian name for the center vortex, which was referred to as the Gate of God. In ancient Buddhism, it was customary to represent the way to enlightenment as an eight-spoked wheel, the Dharma wheel. The Mayan cross of Quetzalcoatl depicted the center point where Quetzalcoatl would pass on his nightly journey. The ancient depictions of Shambhala show an eight-petaled lotus, and a compass has eight rays on it pointing to this divine location. The Sumerians used an eight-pointed star to represent the goddess Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess known as the Light Bringer. The Greeks recognized Venus as the morning star, and this has continued today. In the book The Memory of Asenian, The Other Face of Jesus, it is written, Look very well at that star behind me. It is one of the symbols of our people. Look, that is the big morning star. We call her Ishtar. We see eight raid symbols across the world. They go back to Ishtar symbolism. So what is the connection between Venus and the lands beneath the center of our flat realm? The stars above are not physical planetary bodies, but sonoluminescent lights representative of realms and energy portals. What we call Venus above is indeed the sonoluminescent reflection of the black sun. Venus has been getting brighter and brighter each year, and this is because human consciousness is expanding. The very vehicle that powers the collective that we are inseparable from is increasing in frequency and therefore we see a brighter, larger luminary above us. Greek legend speaks of an ancient and mostly forgotten civilization, Hyperborea. Hyperborea was a realm of eternal spring located beyond the home of the north wind, Boreas. Its people were a long-lived race untouched by war, toil, and the ravages of old age and disease. The border of Hyperborea was guarded by the bitterly cold peaks of Boreas's mountain. Beyond these lived the one-eyed Aramispeans, and further on the gold-guarding griffins. Beyond these griffins lived the Hyperboreans. The griffin is a legendary creature with the body of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle. As the lion was traditionally considered the king of the beasts and the eagle the king of the birds, the griffin was thought to be an especially powerful and majestic creature. It was a symbol of divine power and a guardian of the divine. The English word griffin derives from the Greek word griffon, or grips. The Greeks, however, had derived their word from the Assyrian kerub, a word and a creature that seems to be directly related to the Hebrew cherub. Those who are familiar with the Bible know that after man was driven out of the Garden of Eden, cherubim were stationed to protect it. 
Hyperborea was the original Garden of Eden. In this Golden Age civilization, man transgressed divine law, the ultimate price being his banishment to the outside world, outside of this paradise. Man ventured into other regions of Earth, establishing new civilizations, bringing to an end this great and glorious Golden Age. Miguel Serrano in Na's Book of the Resurrection which, by the way, is a must-read for those interested in the Flat Earth Trinity of Sun, Black Sun, and Astral Light, writes, In this interior Earth are the cities of Agarti, Shambhala, and the Caesars, inhabited by the immortal Siddhas. There, the Golden Age still exists. It is the invulnerable paradise which our people have rediscovered, where the science of resurrection and eternal love is guarded. Every description of the Golden Age, whether it's Greek, or Indian, relates how the gods walked with men in a perfect and harmonious environment, balanced between the terrestrial and celestial. Humanity suffered no sickness and no aging in this timeless paradise. After the fall, man fell into time and suffering, forfeiting the gift of immortality. It's more than possible that this golden age is a distant memory of when humanity was situated in the inner earth paradise of Hyperborea. The left-hand path and right-hand path refers to a dichotomy between two opposing approaches to magic. We are all magicians, manipulating reality with the vehicle of our consciousness. So through our individual actions, we are either taking the left or right-hand path. The left-hand path is the path of debauchery and chaos, carnism, the anything-goes mentality, power, physical gratification. The right-hand path is the path of purity, wholesomeness, oneness, spiritual gratification. Neither is bad or good, they are just different modes of consciousness, action, and intent. The left-hand path corresponds to Saturn, the planet of limitation but equally of power and fame, all of the demiurgic values that lead to chaos and a degradation of spiritual essence and collective sovereignty. The right-hand path corresponds to Venus, the planet of love and harmony, all of the pure values that lead to abundance. We go back to the two halves of our brains, Saturn being the left-brained masculine, Venus being the right-brained feminine. Venus, or as we explored earlier, the black sun, rules the heart chakra, the wellspring of love, warmth, compassion, and joy. When opened, it's a unifying chakra, and is the bridge between the lower three chakras, the animalistic qualities in us, and the upper ones, the spiritual, transcendent qualities. Saturn rules the root chakra. This chakra relates to our ability to be grounded, to attain material success, and the ability to focus and manifest our individual needs. If we are to take the right-hand path, meaning that of empathy and unity, we are following Venus, the Black Sun merging with the Gnostic Sophia, with wisdom. If we are to take the left-hand path, we are following the false light system set in place by the tandem energies of Saturn and the Moon, which recycles soul back to this physical plane due to a lack of awareness and a blindness to spiritual sovereignty. The Demiurge sprang forth from Sophia, much like our shadow selves materialize away from our original divine intelligence. We are aspects of Sophia being played out in this reality, but we can align with both sides of the Black Sun, our shadow selves or with Divine Wisdom, Saturn or Venus. This goes back to the intentions necessary to pass the Cherubim, the Griffins, the Flaming Sword, and into Hyperborea. Those who follow the right-hand path are indeed able to set forth on the path to the Tree of Life. In the lexicon of religious symbols, the tree of life is one of the holiest and most universal. There is a tree that bears the fruit of wisdom and eternal life in every one of the myths of Shambhala, the Buddhist inner earth paradise. And as a symbol of the Axis Mundi, this sacred tree sometimes replaces the mountain at the center of cosmology, while at other times it grows on its summit. What we know as the Christmas tree is a part of this mythology telling us the same story I'm telling you in this presentation. The evergreen tree we call the Christmas tree, with candles flickering on its branches and gifts laying around where its roots used to lay, 
was once honored as the tree of life. The greenness of the tree represents the aurora borealis, the sign and the promise of eternal life. The aura of Ra, a symbolic reference similar to the green lion devouring the sun. The star on top is also a mythic image of Polaris the North Star, laying directly above the Axis Mundi. The Finnish national epic, the Kalevala, is a fairy tale like story that directly addresses the longings of the soul that a modern person feels trying to find his place in the world and connection to spirit. In the story, three great heroes must go to the North Land, Kalevala, and battle the old woman of the North to ride on the Rainbow of the North, which I naturally correlate with the Norse Rainbow Bridge to Asgard, home of the gods. The ancient smithy Ilmarinen forges the great desire of the old woman of the north, what is termed as the Sampo, to win one of her daughters. Harald Falk Yitter tells us in his book Aurora the Northern Lights in Mythology, History, and Science that the Aurora Borealis is the same as the Sampo from the Kalevala. The Sampo is roofed over by a many colored lid, which also revolves and is called the Vaults of Heaven or heavenly spheres. It is defined as colorful, embroidered with rune and script, or the revolving vault of the heavens filled with brilliant stars. The Sampo in this story is the visible aspect of Shambhala, covering the North Pole where the ethers rush into the atmosphere of the Earth, mitigated by the magnetic torus field of the Earth. Winning this Sampo, as the Finnish story says, is the ultimate prize for men. It is a sort of marriage to another part of yourself that is transmitted from the cosmos through the currents that bring the etheric formative forces into play, the etheric body of the earth and the human body. In Peter Pan, the way to Neverland, land of eternal youth and adventure, is through the second star to the right and straight on till morning. This is Venus, the morning star, the sono-luminescent representation of the black sun shown luminous and full in the Disney rendition, with the rainbow bridge clear. We cannot travel through stars while we inhabit these flesh suits, but in these physical bodies, we can absolutely follow our compasses, fly with the aurora borealis, and drink from the holy grail by merging into the eighth chakra, the sunya. Thank you for watching. Stay well and centered, everyone. I love you all.